Welcome back to another episode of What's in the Night Sky for May 2021. And there are a lot of exciting events to look forward to this month. So we've got a total lunar eclipse, the Eta Aquarius meteor shower. Those of us in the Northern Hemisphere will be keeping an eye out for the first sighting of noctilucent clouds. It's also the first month in a while that you will be able to see all five of the naked eye visible planets. And talking of planets, Mercury reaches greatest eastern elongation this month. But before we deep dive into all of that and more, a quick message from the sponsors of today's video, Skillshare. Skillshare is an online learning community for creators where millions come together to take the next step in their creative journey. There are thousands of inspiring classes covering a huge range of topics such as graphic design, photography, freelancing and more. I'm sure many of you watching this video will appreciate Ian Norman's class on Nightscapes, an introduction to all things landscape astrophotography. Or how about James Manning's Astronomy for Starscapes, which will help you make sense of the night sky and plan your astrophotographs with newfound knowledge. I've been using Skillshare for over two years now and making use of their courses on freelancing, running a business, but also Photoshop, logo design and animation classes that help me create the introduction clip to this series. So if you want to try Skillshare Premium for yourself and get access to all of those courses, the first 1000 people to click the link in the video description will get a completely free trial of Skillshare Premium for a limited time. Starting in the Northern Hemisphere, where you really want to be making the most of the last of the darkness if you're at mid to high latitudes. But facing west, you can now catch Venus and Mercury very briefly in the evening skies. So Venus returning to the night sky after passing superior conjunction in March. And if I skip through the days, you'll see just how much Venus and Mercury change positions every evening. And on the 17th is when Mercury reaches greatest eastern elongation. It will be its furthest from the sun in the night sky. It will be 22 degrees from the sun. And as I continue towards the end of the month, you'll notice them coming closer and closer and closer until the 28th. They'll be right next to each other, almost like the great conjunction we had with Saturn and Jupiter towards the end of last year but this time with the two bright inferior planets. But be aware, it will be very difficult to catch this coupling. You need some perfectly clear skies and a nice clear view of the horizon. Something like a sea view would be perfect, but they're both shining pretty bright. So if you do have those conditions, you should be able to spot them in the evening skies. Now, zooming out a little bit, but still facing west in the evening skies, you'll notice now the last glimpse of Orion's arm. And he's also being followed by Gemini. And you'll notice this month that between the twins of Gemini is where you'll find Mars, the red planet. This month shining at a pretty modest magnitude plus 1.6. And setting at around 1 a.m. Facing north towards the circumpolar constellations, you'll notice Ursa Major, Ursa Minor, and Draco the Dragon, all very high in the sky at this time of year. So you have the likes of Bode's Galaxy, Cigar Galaxy, and the very photogenic Pinwheel Galaxy, all within Ursa Major. So if you have a star tracker or a telescope, they can be pretty good targets, as I talked about last month. But you'll also notice Cassiopeia very low on the northern horizon, almost moving parallel with the horizon. And there's a faint section of the Milky Way running through Cassiopeia towards Cygnus. And as we pass midnight, you'll notice Cygnus climbing higher into the eastern skies and then eventually leading to a good opportunity for a Milky Way arch facing east with the core rising into the southeast and the Milky Way arching over the east. And then as we enter the pre-dawn hours and the Milky Way climbs higher and higher into the southeast, you'll also notice Saturn closely followed by Jupiter rising into the east and sitting underneath that Milky Way arch. And now the Milky Way core 
making its way into the south and that is the highest that it will be above the horizon for your location. So this will be a really good opportunity to get the best detail out of the Milky Way core. On to the southern hemisphere and facing south towards the circumpolar constellations you'll notice the Crux and Corina constellations very high in the sky. Again, great regions for star trackers. And you'll also notice the small Magellanic Cloud and large Magellanic Cloud making their way down low to the horizon. So this is a really good opportunity to capture those with a foreground interest and a nice long focal length so you can really unveil the detail in the Magellanic Clouds. Facing west in the evening skies you should catch a glimpse of the inferior planets Venus and Mercury. So Venus returning to the night sky after passing superior conjunction in March and as I switch through the days you'll see just how much they both change positions in the sky each evening and it's on the 17th where Mercury reaches greatest eastern elongation. So this is the furthest it will be from the sun in the sky. It'll be 22 degrees away from the sun. As I skip through the days towards the end of the month, you'll notice them coming closer and closer and closer until on the 29th, they will be right next to each other in a great conjunction. Well, not quite a great conjunction as we saw with Saturn and Jupiter, but a great inferior conjunction of the two inferior planets, Venus and Mercury. But be aware, you will need perfectly clear skies and a nice clear view of the horizon to catch these two together. So a nice sea view is perfect. If you don't have any mountains or high terrain in your local area, you should have a better chance of catching these two together. Zooming out and still facing west, you guys in the southern hemisphere will still have one last glimpse of the constellation Orion and he sinks to the western horizon along with Gemini and you will also find Mars passing through the twins this month. Mars shining at a modest plus 1.6 and setting around 9.10pm. Swinging east and the Milky Way core rises a lot earlier in the Southern Hemisphere than it does in the Northern Hemisphere. So as you can see, by around 9 o'clock, the Milky Way core already above the horizon. By 10 p.m., it's in a very decent position in the night sky. And if I just pause it there, because it's a really good opportunity for a Milky Way arch facing south, and you'll get the small and large Magellanic clouds underneath the Milky Way arch. The Milky Way core continues to rise higher and higher into the eastern skies, and then around local midnight is when you'll see Jupiter and Saturn rising in the east. So Saturn arriving first within the constellation Capricornus, and Jupiter following about 45 minutes later and Jupiter in the constellation Aquarius and as you get close to 2 a.m. 3 a.m. the Milky Way core almost directly overhead for most of those in the southern hemisphere an amazing time to get the star tracker out and get some really nice detail on the galactic center of our whole Milky Way just as I did with this image that I took in the Atacama Desert this time two years ago. Now the full moon this month falls on the 26th, so you want to get all of your Milky Way shots done at the beginning of the month. And it is known as the flower moon this month, which sounds like some spring hippie gathering, but it is of course the name the Native Americans gave it due to the abundance of blooming flowers at this time of year in the Northern Hemisphere. As for conjunctions and close approaches, between the 3rd and the 5th, the last quarter moon passes by Saturn and Jupiter in the morning skies. On the 13th, the moon will be right next to Mercury in the evening skies. That's shortly before Mercury reaches greatest eastern elongation. And then a few days later, on the 15th and the 16th, the crescent moon will be much higher in the sky, passing by Mars. As for the special events this month, so on the 5th to the 6th, we have the peak of the Eta Aquarid meteor shower. 
Normally, meteor showers have a peak night or a peak morning where the rates of meteors are drastically increased. But the Etoraquarid meteor shower has more of a broad peak. So you have similar rates in the days before and days after the official peak. So it's always worth trying the nights and mornings before and after the peak. And this year, the nights before the 5th will have a quarter moon in the morning skies, but the nights after the 5th will only have a crescent moon in the morning skies. And that's definitely something to consider because any moonlight will hinder the fainter meteors. Now it's called the Eta Required Meteor Shower because the radiant point is within the constellation Aquarius and it's very close to the faint star Eta Aquarii. However, there's a bit of confusion around the radiant point. There's a lot of news articles and media outlets that will tell you you have to look in the direction of the radiant point. This is simply not true. Meteors will fall all over the sky, but if you trace a line backwards from the path that they followed, they will all intersect at the radiant point in Aquarius. Now, because the radiant point is in Aquarius, which is right on the celestial equator, this meteor shower does favor the southern hemisphere. It's one of the better meteor showers that you can see from the southern hemisphere. So those of you in the southern hemisphere will likely see rates of 20, perhaps even 40 meteors per hour. Those of you in the Northern Hemisphere will still be able to see some meteors. It will help to face somewhat eastward in the direction where Aquarius will rise, but you can expect much reduced rates, so perhaps 10 per hour maybe at mid-Northern latitudes. But it's a little bit better if you're closer to the equator. But the rate of meteors increases the higher the radiant point is in the sky. And Aquarius rises higher and higher and higher into the pre-dawn hours. So you normally get higher meteors just before sunrise, just before twilight starts breaking in the morning hours. But ultimately, try and get out even in the days before the peak and the days after the peak and expect the meteors to increase the closer you get to the morning twilight. Now the full moon this month is on the 26th and depending on where you are on Earth, you might be able to see a total lunar eclipse. And during a total lunar eclipse, the moon will fade and darken, much like in a partial eclipse. But once it gets inside the umbra, the moon turns a gorgeous crimson red, often referred to as a blood moon. And it occurs because of Earth's atmosphere. So even though Earth is blocking the moon from being directly illuminated by the sun's light, the sun's light passes into Earth's atmosphere, which scatters the blue and green wavelengths, but refracts the red and orange lengths. So the light is always being bent around Earth and only the red and orange wavelengths of light are illuminating the moon. It's almost as if the moon is being illuminated by sunsets from all around the world. So if you were standing on the moon, there would be a gorgeous glowing red ring around Earth in the night sky. That would be awesome to see. Now, in order to see the total phase of the lunar eclipse, you need to be in the Pacific, hopefully on an island, not like swimming in the middle of the Pacific Ocean, or Eastern Asia, Japan, Australia, Western North America, and also the southern tip of, of Southern America. But I'll put a map up on screen so you can see where the eclipse is visible from. And of course, I'll put links in the video description down below so you can get more specific advice for your exact location. But it's a very short-lived lunar eclipse. It only just dips into the umbral shadow. And so totality only lasts for 14 minutes. So it's a very, very short total lunar eclipse. But if you want some more tips on how to photograph a total lunar eclipse, you should check out my vlog from 2019, which I'll link above and down below in the video description. And lastly, this month we will probably see the first sighting of noctilucent clouds for this year's noctilucent cloud season. So noctilucent clouds, which translates from Latin as night shining clouds, are the highest known clouds to exist. They form about 80 to 85 kilometers above the surface of Earth in a layer of atmosphere known as the mesosphere. And they form over the polar regions. They form above the North Pole and the Arctic. But they're so high that even when the sun has set for observers, the light of the sun illuminates the clouds from underneath and they glow against the dark backdrop of twilight. So if you're at latitudes of 50 degrees north to 65 degrees north, 
you're in for a very good chance of seeing the first Noctilucent clouds this year. I won't go into much more detail than that because I have an entire video on my YouTube channel about Noctilucent clouds and also good detail about how to photograph them. So again, I'll link that up above and down in the video description below. And that's all I've got for you this month, guys. Now onto the hashtag Wittens. For those of you that are new here, every month I set a target subject to photograph and then people upload their images to social media using the hashtag Wittens. And I pick my favorite three of the month to win a prize. Third place wins a copy of my Astro Workflow Lightroom presets. Second place wins a What's in the Night Sky t-shirt. And first place wins a photo view photography guidebook of their choice. Last month's challenge was basically any of the special events last month. So there was a lunar occultation of Mars, a supermoon, there were meteor showers and conjunctions. So in third place, congratulations to Astro Saldana for capturing the Nova in Cassiopeia. As I mentioned in last month's video, there is a Nova in Cassiopeia, a new star not really a new star, but one that has suddenly brightened enough to be visible. And in joint third place was Leonardo with this image of the pinwheel galaxy and lucky to catch a really nice meteor. And you can see the vapor trails coming off the meteor there, nice and bright in red color as well. I thought this was really awesome. So both of you guys win a copy of my Astro Workflow Lightroom presets. In Second place was Shivam with this beautiful image of the lunar occultation of Mars just at the very last moment before Mars disappeared or perhaps reappeared from behind the moon. So very well done to Shivam. And in first place was this image by Ben Obi-Wan. And I love this image. The twilight colors are gorgeous. It's a very sharp, high quality image. I love the similarity in size of the moon and the glassed sphere there. But I think my favorite feature of this photograph is the reflection of the sunset in the glass in that sphere. It just looks awesome. And it's a really great way to depict why the moon is full. And that is, of course, because it is directly opposite the sun. So very well done to Ben. And I would love to see you recreate this image again, but with an eclipse of the glass sphere and the moon. I think getting those two in line with each other perfectly would be super awesome. As for this month, I think let's just go with the same. Let's just go with the special events this month. So bonus points for the first sighting of Noctilucent Clouds or perhaps the Lunar Eclipse this month or perhaps the Eterocquired Meteor Shower or of course any of the conjunctions with the moon and planets. So thank you all for tuning in to another episode of What's in the Night Sky. And if you're going out to enjoy the night sky anytime soon, I wish you good luck and clear skies.